welcome. So happy to see this wonderful crowd. I'm Liz Brailsford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And I am happy to welcome you to the 2022 Mike Rawlings Endowed Lecture, The American Middle, with the distinguished speakers, the Honorable Mike Rawlings and the Honorable Joe Strauss, and moderated by Rudolf Bush of the Dallas Morning News. We're so happy you could join us, so thank you for taking the time. I think you will find tonight's insights illuminating and applicable to today's times. It's something that is a conversation around a lot of our dinner tables or uh, around the water cooler, and I think it's uh, important that we continue to discuss what we, a lot of us view as a problem in today's world. So I want to start by thanking our founding donors, the Rawlings Endowed Lecture, the Billingsley Company, the Beck Group, Crow Holdings, Hall Group, Tim Headington and Headington Companies, KDC Real Estate Development, and Laura and Jack, uh, Jack Matthews. Additional supporters of the Rawlings Lecture include Doug Chestnut, Jill and Michael Dardick, Frank Michalopoulos, Herb Weitzman, and Abigail and Todd Williams. I want to thank the Hilton Anatole for hosting us in this beautiful space. We do programs here on occasion. We always love being here and partnering with them. And I'd also like to thank our council's institutional members, NEC Corporation of America and Lockheed. And uh, thank you to them. And then I also just want to take a really quick moment to recognize the board members that we have in the audience tonight. Our chair, Dave Meyer, is in the audience. Also, thank you to Sarah Dodd, our vice chair, Mar Marvin Singleton, uh, Steve Gardner, Betts Lillo, and Kirk Teske. Thank you very much for being here. It means a lot to me. And if you're not a member of our council yet, we do programs like this a lot. We have critical conversations that make progress in our communities and help us understand differing viewpoints and opinions that may be different from our own. We do this all the time. We have around 70 programs a year. If you're new to the World Affairs Council, please go to our website at dfwworld.org to look at the membership options that we have. I'd love for you to join our engaged and informed citizenry. Join our membership. I'd love that. Okay, now on to this evening. Please allow me to introduce Rudy Bush, Vice President and Editorial Page Editor at the Dallas Morning News. He previously served as Deputy at Editorial Page Editor, Dallas City Hall and Investigative Reporter and City, uh, City Desk News Editor. Bush covered crime in the federal courts, the Chicago Tr Tribune, and later became a national correspondent in the newspaper's Washington Bureau. He has an MA and an MBA from the University of Dallas, where he served as the Director of Journalism from 2014 to 2022. Now, to get on to the most important uh, pieces of the evening, welcome Rudy to the stage. <clears throat> Thank, thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to all of you uh, for joining us for the Mike Rawlings Endowed Lecture sponsored by the World Affairs Council and the Dallas Morning News. As uh, Liz told you, I'm Rudy Bush. I'm the editorial page editor for the Dallas Morning News. My colleague, uh, deputy editorial page editor, Julieta Chiquillo, was scheduled to deliver these opening remarks. I, I regret to tell you she's had a personal circumstance and she won't be able to be with us tonight. So uh, you're stuck with me uh, for a little bit longer. But look, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here I'm, be, because uh, it shows me that you care about uh, this important topic as much as the people who are going to be on the stage tonight with me care. And, and it really is about the health of our democracy uh, and the future of our, our country. Earlier this year, our publisher, Grant Moise, began to speak to me about an idea he wanted our uh, newspaper to explore that he called the middle. Most people, he said, want to live in the middle. Our conversations around this question led to an ongoing editorial project that we call the American Middle that has set out to explore what most Americans think about the issues that divide us and to try to understand the political, technological, social, and media structures that exacerbate the polarization that so many of us are so frustrated by. 
after our initial essay published in uh, September, my friend Mike Rawlings called me and asked if this lecture uh, could be devoted to the topic. And I frankly couldn't say yes fast enough. Was very grateful for the chance. So here we are, and I can't imagine two better people to discuss this important topic than the ones who are with us tonight, but I'll get to those introductions in just a moment. First, I want to share here some important material we laid out in this first essay to help understand how the American middle sees complex issues versus the way they are treated in our political life, in our, in our political sphere. And I should stop here just to thank the Pew Research Center, which partnered with us uh, on this project and provided much of the data that you'll see. I, I should say before I get uh, into this data, into these numbers, that we're not trying to resolve these issues here tonight. Uh, they told me to keep expectations low. I'm going to do that. Um, but what, what, what I want to show you is something I think you'll intuit when you see this material, and that is that the way most Americans view these questions uh, is much more complex and nuanced than the way that they are presented to us in the political sphere. Abortion. There are few issues that are presented as such a clear binary politically as abortion. You're either pro-choice or pro-life. The reality is, and this can be tracked in polling data going back many, many years, most Americans have nuanced and complex views on when abortion should be legal and when it should be restricted. Immigration. This is another issue that politicians and frankly the press uh, often treat as a for or against that does not reflect how the middle views immigration. Many people hold two ideas in their minds at once that border security is important, and that there should be a path to legal residence uh, and citizenship for undocumented people. Guns. After the Uvalde massacre, Senator John Cornyn helped lead passage of a bipartisan bill with modest new gun safety regulations. Most Americans approve of these measures, but gun regulation remains a largely divisive political topic. And finally, voting. Here again, we see a divergence between the middle's point of view and how matters are treated politically. There is overwhelming support for requiring government identification at the polling place. But gun regul, excuse me, um, just as there is uh, substantial support for automatic registration of all Americans who are uh, eligible to vote. Now, one thing that I think is interesting is that as the, as, as the two dominant political parties have done less and less to find common ground and to seek solutions, more and more Americans have drifted away from them. Uh, and can any of us be surprised by that? In the 90s, roughly as many Americans identified themselves as Republicans or Democrats as they did independents. That has shifted sharply with fewer people identifying with an individual political party, and more as independent. And if you sort this by age, you can see that younger people are much more likely to identify as independents. So with that background, let me introduce two men who have been on the front lines of politics and who have done the serious work of governing at times at a personal and a political cost. Joe Strauss was the longest serving Republican Speaker of the House in Texas history. From San Antonio, he joined the legislature in 2005 and served as Speaker from 2009 to 2019. His focus was on the core work of government, lifting up public education, building a ready workforce, expanding mental health services, and championing the state's development. In 2017, the Dallas Morning News named him Texan of the Year for his moderating influence on Texas government. Michael S. Rawlings was the 59th mayor of the city of Dallas. A lifelong Democrat, he served in the nonpartisan role from 2011 to 2019. That's two terms, which most modern Dallas mayors do not serve. 
During his years in office, he governed the city through the Ebola crisis, a police and fire pension crisis, and the tragedy of July 7th when five police officers were murdered downtown. Both Speaker Strauss and Mayor Rawlings understand how critical it is that our cities, our state, and our nation be governed with principle and through the founders belief that those who are elected to public office are vested with a profound responsibility to govern not in the name of narrow concerns, but in the interest of the greatest good for all. And it's my pleasure to welcome them to the stage. I'm on the right. Uh, I'll sit in the middle. <laughs> okay, good. Tony, you're on the left. They're left. <laughs> you guys are exactly where you should be. I'm not sure about my spot. I've got the lights in my eyes. Um, now, you normally ask the questions at these things, right? Mm -hmm. But I like to ask the questions. That, you know that. You're the, uh, you're the media. If y'all yeah. are arguing, I'll be happy to ask, <laughs> ask the questions. We'll let you ask some questions. But look, okay, so both of you have been in government. You've, uh, as I said, been on the front lines. And I think the, the diagnosis that a lot of us want as we come out of the midterms, as we've been through the madness of, of January uh, 6, I mean, how, how bad is it from, from your point of view? And who wants to go first? Joe, I'm looking right at you. <laughs> That's what I get for being the out-of-town yeah. right. uh, guest. It's named after him. <laughs> True. I'm not, all I, I got a free dinner out of it. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, it's obviously bad enough that the World Affairs Council, who ought to be talking about trade and foreign policy and international issues, is hosting a forum about this topic. And it's bad enough that a whole bunch of people came out to hear it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not good. The state of American politics is not good. But the fact that so many people understand it, realize this, and want to do something about it to change the trajectory and change where we are is positive. And long term, maybe not very long term, um, we're going to steer the ship in the right direction. But clearly, we have a big problem, and we're not through it yet. Um, we can talk about the recent elections from just a few weeks ago that I think you know, were very positive all in all. Um, both parties have something to be happy about. Yeah. I think, and it was good for the country to show that voters kind of looked over the hard partisanship and showed some discernment. So the answer is it's bad, but it's not so bad that Americans can't fix it and seem to be moving in that direction. You know, first of all, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and thank the people that sponsored this lecture. I, again, I'm, I'm honored to have my name on it. So I just, for the, you folks out there that did that, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I think that's a good synopsis. I, I don't, I'm not a uh, kind of a, a, uh, a popular person in sometimes my groups because the world, I, I hang with people that the, say the, the, the sky is falling and the world's about to end. And I'm a little more hopeful about that. Um, I, I think, that America's done remarkable things over the last couple hundred years. And really, when you look at what's happened just in the last couple decades, it's remarkable. So the end result, I'm kind of more of a Buffettite in that regards. I see that. There's no question it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's and you want to use the word bad in, in that regards, I think it's important. <clears throat> to to use it that way, but I'm I'm pretty hopeful. I look, the speaker knows more of this than I do, but 
when I, I was an outsider in politics, and when I came in, you know, I was just kind of a business leader, and I wanted to go from here to there. I'd just jump off, and I'd go there. And I realized in politics, you can't do that. You're not on terra firma. You use the analogy of a ship, OK? You're really sailing a boat, if you will, and the waters are choppy, and the, the you know, George Floyd wind blows this way, and, and, and um, uh, CRT blows this way, and, and you don't even know what you're doing half the time, so you have to tack this thing. And at times, the, the, the sailboat kind of starts to tip over, and you think this thing's going to fall. Uh, and yes, you've got K Captain Ahab up at the top with an uh, eye patch on and trying to catch something. It's just, it's like, what is going on? But somehow that sailboat always kind of comes back. And, is, and I, I try to figure out why, and I, I think it's because what you're talking about here tonight. It's when you build a boat, not that I built one, but they start with the keel first. And the keel is this massive thing that balances this. And that's what the, the middle is. It's, it's a balance. It doesn't get all the, the fanfare of the other stuff, but it's really important that that's solid. And I think we need to understand that better, nurture that better, um, and applaud the keel, even though it's running under the water. And I think that's what has happened here. So that's why I'm hopeful. It, the boat goes fast when it's like that. It's just scary as hell, OK? You just have to kind of jump to the other side if, if anybody has so, uh, sailed before. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I think that the hopefulness that you're both expressing sort of emerges from this midterm cycle we came out of when uh, we saw extremism sort of defeated in, on, on both sides. You can find examples where really polarized candidates uh, didn't win. And so, yes, you can take a degree of optimism from, from that. At the same time, I think one of the things that emerged as, as we've gone through uh, really the, the, the past six, seven years is that maybe there are structural problems in our uh, either in our democracy or within our society or within our political system that are going to return us yeah. to the place where we were and that if we don't start to think seriously about how we're going to address these structural problems, we're just going to get back there <clears throat> in a different space with a different uh, leader who maybe is even more powerful in terms of steering things in a certain way. So I just want to ask you about that. You know, what, what are the things that might be broken that we need to fix? Yeah, it seems like the boat sure tips a lot. And it's like, <laughs> is that necessary to right. do that? Um, uh, look, it's at, at different levels. I mean, I've got points of view on city government in Dallas and in Texas and at the national level. So probably different ones are, 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 are different. But I think the system is built that the powerful, the people that are in charge, continue their dominance. Yeah. And uh, it's not like the NFL where the best team goes the, the bottom and the worst team goes the top for the top draft pick. I mean, you know, it's, it, it perpetuates itself. And, and there, I think, is part of the, part of the issue that we've got. Um, yeah. And so you've been in party politics a good bit, and so talk about that. I mean, what, what are the, are there structural problems, either within the party system or within our electoral system that we need to be thinking about in serious ways? Sure, there are plenty of structural issues that can be debated, talk about reforms of, of elect, you know, how we elect people, how parties are structured, the primary system, Ranked choice voting is topical in a lot of conversations yeah. these days. Um, all of those things, but it's very unlikely that in this state that any meaningful reforms are gonna get made because the system that we have right now is electing the people that we'd be asking to make these reforms. Yeah. They're not gonna do that. Right. <laughs> when I was in the legislature, um, 
I was very open-minded and supported to, you know, uh, some sort of a redistricting um, commission. How'd that go over? Oh, it, oh, it sailed know, through. One, well, actually, <laughs> one session when we were very closely divided, didn't have a, a strong Republican majority, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of House members who signed on to the bill. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they supported it, <laughs> um, as we learned, and as many of us kind of knew from the get-go. So I guess my point is, we can debate, we can suggest, we can talk about structural changes and reforms, but the only thing that's really gonna change where we are is leadership. It's gonna be leaders who step out above the system that elected them and do some things that are hard from time to time for the public good. Yeah. And there are examples of that that happen from time to time, but it's not often enough right now. It's not, it's not something that's seen to be rewarding or rewarded, so you don't see enough of it. And that's where, the, where we all come in. We have to begin to reward people in public office and in leadership for doing these things, like John Cornyn did on the, on the guns and the senator from Connecticut. Sure, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't everything that anybody, anybody wanted, but it was a good compromise. And it was moving forward and not failing. Um, so more of that on more issues by more leaders is really what's gonna get us out of this. You know, you, you spoke about it in your editorial Sunday about primary mm -hmm. and, and the, the primary voters and and I'm fascinated by that, yeah. about how the American middle doesn't vote in primaries. Yeah. It just boggles my mind. In fact, I saw a, um, um, a group, um, they came up with a new idea, and it worked very well, uh, where they actually sent um, a direct mail piece to people that didn't vote and said, we saw you didn't vote in the primary. <laughs> they shamed these people, and when they got that piece of mail, they actually voted, and the more moderate people won. Yeah, but it, let me play devil's advocate on that for just, just a minute. And, and, and I, it goes without saying, right, that everyone should exercise their right to vote. I, I feel like it's a little unfair to the electorate, though, when you have a political system that is, outcomes are often baked in. And uh, yes, you might have a primary where you have uh, a, a very extreme person versus a slightly less extreme person, and the most likely person who's going to win is the very extreme person. And oftentimes they're jockeying to see who can be on that side. So you're in the middle, your idea is to energize yourself to go vote for the lesser of two evils in your mind, knowing that, okay, when we get to the general election, whoever the district is cooked for is going to win, right? So yeah. I guess that's what I'm asking about when I'm talking about structures is we can't, and I want, I want you both to react to this, we can't keep asking people to vote if they don't feel like they have anybody to vote for or anything really to vote for that they, that they can be inspired by and believe in. I mean, do you disagree with that, Joe? No, I don't. I think that's, I think that's the root of the reason why there were, what, three million people who voted in the primaries in Texas in 2022 and eight million voted in the general. Neither one of those numbers are anything to brag about, by the way. Um, but which, which primary are you going to be attracted to if you're not interested in, you know, a hard base um, place to be? So I think you're right. It's not, the primaries are not inviting to those of us, and I'm going to push back, not to sound like an ungrateful guest, but I'm going to push back a little bit on this middle concept because... I, n I never felt like in the time I was in public office that I was in the middle. I was always what I started out to be, 
as a you know, pretty conservative, right of center Republican. And I wasn't embarrassed about that, but I felt like it was important once I had the public trust to uh, perform in public office that I work with other people <laughs> who also got elected by constituents of theirs. So I think there's, I don't wanna get too lost in this middle and confuse that with people who are willing to compromise, yeah. who are working, who are willing to negotiate. Kind of two different things, aren't they? Yes. There, there is a philosophy of being in the middle, and then there's, you can have people on not in the middle that are open to compromise. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, well, weirdly, uh, today I, I had an interview with S Senator Cornyn for something I'm working on for, for later in the year, and, and I, part of the interview was to talk to him about his year, and obviously he was involved in uh, passing uh, legislation after Uvalde, and I don't think anyone would describe John Cornyn as in the middle, right? He is, uh, he, he's, he's obviously well to the right, but what he articulated today that I think is what, what you're articulating now is he will find places where there can be working. So I don't necessarily think that the middle has to uh, be invested in one person in office. It's, it's the outcomes that come from actually doing the legislative work, and you did the legislative work. There are plenty of peop people in office now, would you agree, their interest in legislating is almost nil because they've got a tweet. You're, the, the, those, you know, social media isn't gonna write itself. Yeah, no, no doubt, there are people especially at the national level, who are members of Congress or senators, like the senator that John Cornyn has to work with and is a constant problem for him. Um, <clears throat> you can name names. I didn't mention what state. No. <laughs> um, but they're, they're, they're interested in attention. The more attention they get, the more money they raise. The more money they raise, the higher their profile becomes. They're more interested in being on, you know, my party in Fox News than they are in getting legislative accomplishments across the finish line. So they're, I mean, it's not a, that's not a new problem, but it's much worse than it was because of social media and because of the attention that's available to them to talk only to their base. Yeah. That's all they're interested in. I mean, if you're, you're from Dallas, can you, outside of members of Congress from your delegation, can you, name, can you name some members of Congress? The ones you're likely to come up with are the ones that are waving their arms out there with you know, acronyms like AOC or MTG <laughs> or some, you know, that nut from Florida. And it's not because they've done anything, it's not because they've done anything legislatively as part of their job, it's because they're good at getting attention and they know how to play the public yeah. and they're succeeding, but they're not getting anything done and they're nothing but a, you know, a real, a real problem. Yeah, I agree. Let, let's talk a little bit about the political parties because both of you have been devoted members of, of your individual parties for, for a long time, but as we showed earlier, more people are identifying as independents. They don't necessarily want a party uh, association. Mike, you've been working with a group called No Labels, uh, and you can talk a little bit about what their plans are, but, but I mean, it, are, are we really shifting away, or is that just ephemera? Well, look, I, it's sort of, uh, a little bit of the answer is, is what Joe talked about, how do you change things in Texas. You, you, you might say that there's room for another party or whatever, but the realistic answer is there's probably not. Just like we're not gonna get forced choice uh, voting in Texas, which I think would be a very smart thing to do because of, of the way our Constitution is written. And I, uh, look, I've been a Democrat since, uh, uh, since the first time I voted, uh, and I could tell you why. Uh, I'm a, uh, a pro-business, fiscally conservative Democrat, 
but I, I'm proud of, of what uh, I've been. The key to me is how do you put country before party? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Do we care about or the city before party or the state before party? And the priorities are extremely uh, important there. I am active in no labels. No labels, I was kind of on the periphery because no labels main objective was to get uh, things happening in Washington. They have a, uh, they support an organization called the Problem Solvers Caucus. And they've got uh, equal groups of Democrats and Republicans on either side that can work through and be swing and a lever point to get uh, uh, legislation actually done, okay? Now, you can imagine the political um, issues they face when they go against their speaker or their leader in, in that party. It's tough, but that was their main focus. Yeah. They have shifted a little bit to try to get out in front of a potential train wreck, okay, that we might have in 24, where you might have a crazy ex-president, whoever that might be, okay, <laughs> and an unelectable person on the left. And most of America is saying, isn't there a better choice? And they've done a lot of polling and understand how this works, very complicated, but doable, and be poised if that happens for some sort of insurance policy. And I think for me, as much of a strong Democrat as I am, I've got so much passion to make sure what has happened in the recent years doesn't happen again, I'm gonna put my effort and try to figure out how you get in, poised in a place that um, uh, we protect from that happening. So just to clear up something that, that the mayor said, there are only two living ex-presidents who served one term, and I'm pretty sure Jimmy Carter is not gonna run. The <laughs> Clear that up. <laughs> should, should we clear up Thanks, that you were talking th about? <laughs> Thanks for that history <laughs> lesson. <laughs> uh, Joe, well, what do you think, uh, Speaker Strauss? Uh, Republican and uh, Democratic parties. I, there, we do have. We did show this polling data that fewer and fewer people are I identifying with them. I mean, I, I don't see that as a weakening structure. But wh where do you think it's going? <laughs> I think those numbers can change depending on who the nominees of the parties are the presidential level next time. If they aren't Carter or Trump, and, they're, and, and both parties nominate, I mean, Biden's not popular. Um, if both parties nominate newer, fresher faces, and faces that can smile once in a while, <laughs> um, you know, that those numbers might change. That's how parties change. It's, they change two ways. They change from the bottom up for sure, but they really change from the top down, easier, quicker. And so if, we, if you come up, and I don't know who, who I have in mind, but if through the process one or both parties nominate fresh faces who can relate to people and you can acknowledge this, that pew chart, and say, look, come, come on along for the ride. It's going to be OK. Then, then you may see a shift. Yeah. But if we get stuck in this rut again, it'll only get worse. So I mean, I, I'm not in the prediction business, but I have a pretty good idea of what the prescription is uh, to change it. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with the parties themselves because they're both in their own way going through some re-examination of, of what they stand for and where they go. Um, I do see a, f a fascinating thing happening in America, and it started with, oh shoot, I can't remember the name of the book that was written about bowling alone, okay? Uh, if you remember that book, yeah. and it was like that people are joining less yeah. and being, it's better to be, I don't like that. 
in being by yourself versus joining into a team. And I see that taking place. In fact, I don't even think you can group independence as a one monolith. If you really look what happened in 22 in this election, I mean, it's, it tells you that all politics are local, okay? And the candidates matter to your point, okay? Uh, some of the, the folks that I'm not sure would score real high on the SATs did not get elected, okay? Yeah. And then some folks that were, you know, didn't deal with the issues that are important to the rest of the public got hurt. You know, so it's, it's they're speaking out. And I think there's a lot of little groups moving about. That, that social alienation question, I think, is a really important one. And one of the things that I think uh, both can dampen polarization but can also exacerbate it is the idea of the belonging, right? So uh, much of what we see uh, as it relates to people, you know, who went on January 6th or uh, participate in these sort of extreme events is that they feel like they are in group with someone, that they're working for something that's a greater cause than themselves. And I just, I'm wondering if you can maybe just talk a little, picking up on that theme, you know, what you see the role of social media and the kind of in-group thinking being in the, in the polarization we see. <clears throat> There's no, no doubt in my mind that social media is a huge problem. But it might be a little bit overblown as a problem relative to, at least speaking as a Republican, the problem that's presented by Fox News. Yeah. And not all of Fox News, but certainly the, the most popular program, um, Tucker Carlson. And I think I'm right about this, that he only has a, while it's a you know, phenomenally commercially successful show, only about three million people watch it. But those three million people are highly motivated. They're gullible too, but they're highly motivated. And they, and they, you know, they get out, they work up their anger and they act out on it as Republicans in primaries. And, you know, there's so much disinformation, not just in social media, but on some of the broadcast media too. Um, Clearly, it's a huge problem. But again, you have to get back to leadership. And the way to get above that is leaders who are willing to, to do it, to do the hard work and to take the risks of uh, not being very popular with you know, a guy like Tucker Carlson yeah. Yeah. Or, or MSNBC people on the other side. Yeah. The, um, you know, I think that you look at social media and it's like guns don't kill people, people kill people. It's like social media doesn't make this bad. People on social media make this bad, okay? Now, is it easy to get guns and should we deal with that issue and is there stuff that we need to do with social media? Yeah, that's a policy issue, but I think as you look at the deeper root cause that we have moved in the last 20 years to a highly performative society. <clears throat> I didn't even know what the word performative meant till I got to City Hall. And, I, <laughs> and, and, and then I realized what people were doing and they, well, they're, they're being performative, okay? And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. They're acting the fool, but you know, they're getting attention. And you'll, you'll, you'll- I was there. Uh, you'll write the, on it and you'll yeah. do stuff because it's dramatic and it's exciting. You have to, it's a train wreck happening. And we've got to, I mean, there's some personal values that have got to be dealt with in this country that does not uh, lift up the egoist and, and lifts up humility. I mean, I remember when Time Magazine put the person of the year, and I don't know if you remember this, and they had the mirror, they had a, mm -hmm. A fancy print of a of a mylar thing that you looked at yourself yeah. and said you're the person of the year and it's like really I'm the person of the year but the point they were making is we're all going to be famous and that's what social media has done and I think to a degree that's why you know about those initials uh, around the country you don't know about the great 
you know, profiles of courage people in this country, which is a great book for those that want to compromise from a history standpoint. Go back and read Kennedy's Profiles in Courage. Profiles in Courage by John F. Kennedy is a fantastic book. It's also a very slim volume. It is. <laughs> you can get through it. You can get through it. Well, let's, let's talk about Texas government a little bit because we have uh, essentially been under one party uh, rule for the better part of, of three decades, right? Um, but in that time, really the way we are governed has changed a good, good bit, I think you'd agree. So maybe talk a little bit about the evolution in state government from where you know, we were uh, in the 90s to where, where we've gotten. Well, in three minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I, think, I think this most recent session of the legislature that I w did not participate in was unlike anything that I had seen. And we'd had plenty of tense moments. We had plenty of meltdowns and breakdowns and made lots of mistakes. But nothing like, in my experience, there was never a break of the quorum where you didn't have, you couldn't conduct business. That's really bad. I mean, that's really bad. <laughs> yeah. um, but other than that, I don't know that it was all that different. Oh, really? And we all had, you know, we had always these tense moments and these dramatic, you know, fights about things. But um, Rick Perry and I, who didn't agree on everything, certainly didn't agree on everything when he decided he wanted to be president. And he was, during those years, that he was governing as a presidential candidate. Um, but he was always, at the end of the sessions, he was always very philosophical. And he would you know, be upset about things he didn't get accomplished or things he asked for, demanded that didn't happen. He was always philosophical, and I think it came from his being a member of the Texas House when he started in politics. He knew how the process worked. He knew how difficult it was to actually pass a bill. Um, and so he would always say, we always leave something to do next time. And he would explain the process. And I appreciated that. We have some leaders, statewide leaders now, and Governor Abbott, and in Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who never served in the House. Patrick served in the Senate for a short time. But I think there's something really special about the Texas House. It's so loud and it's so crazy, and there are so many people and so many different personalities, that unless you've served there, you really don't know the legislative process that well. Um, so I'm gonna say that it hasn't changed that much except except, and it's a big except, for that enormous, unforgivable breakdown of the last session. Okay. You know, I want to uh, put a little rider on his bill there. Um, and for me, what I, I shouldn't be say I was surprised, but what I saw for the first time was this notion that I always believed Republican policy was about smaller government, government getting closer to the people, okay, and empowering people to, to feel involved. And I thought that was one of the good things about Republican policy, is that? And, yeah, but I do, I wanna, I wanna add a couple Go things ahead. I should have mentioned. <clears throat> there were some bills that passed last session that in my time, and not very long ago, would not have even had a committee hearing much less pass into law and be signed by a governor. Um, I'm talking about, among others, the abortion bill. Yep. I mean, that was, however you feel on that issue, that version of the bill that was passed, and we've had a strongly pro-life legislature for ever. I mean, even before Republicans took the majority, that bill, with its specific language would not have made it out of committee. 
and yet it was passed, signed by the governor. The gun legislation would not have passed the committee in the House, yeah, and yet they made it all the way through. So there's, there is something there to legislation um, that's pretty far out there that's yeah. not, being, not being massaged and changed to acceptable ways. Yeah, I, 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 I see that happening that and, and these things start to pick up momentum and kind of moving to the edges on, on those things. I was just going to mention that in my last years of being mayor in that, that session, the animus that I saw between the state elected officials and cities and municipalities yeah. scared me. It was like, you know, because I always thought that the Democrats were more about, you know, uh, power at the top pushing down and the Republicans were building up. And it's like, no, I don't think so. And I think the Republicans, if they've got, they're in charge, they, they don't want cities to do whatever they don't want. You're, you're exactly right. Yeah. The Re Republican Party that I grew up in believed in fiscal restraint, limited government, local decision making, and you know a number of other things, but not now. It's centralized government yeah. where they have the power. Yeah, that's why I was going to ask you to go a little more deeply on the on the state question because the things that I have seen are. You know, the removal of chairmanships from the minority party, uh, the, the um, pushing uh, certain legislation through uh, that wouldn't have seen the light of day once, once upon a time, uh, and, and really a sort of just broad indifference to whether this would be something that were acceptable to a majority of the electorate. And, you know, not, and we can sort of pick on Texas over this, but the same thing happens in uh, states that are wildly gerrymandered uh, to Democratic advantage. I mean, we see that in, mm -hmm. in Illinois. But I, t tonally, uh, and, and then legislatively, I, I would say that the legislature has, has changed a good bit from when you were in charge. Um, but I guess it's you know, kind of a, a point of view on that. This, the, <clears throat> the rules of the legislature in the Senate have changed. Yeah. Patrick, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, tends to get the rules changed to fit the number of Republican votes he needs to get his bills passed. The rules in the Texas House haven't changed, to my knowledge, all that much. And um, you know, you mentioned you mentioned this this movement by the you know base of the Republican Party grassroots. Um, to stop the practice of speakers of the House appointing Democratic chairs of committees. That's been, the, that's been the practice of Democrat speakers appointing Republicans as they started to be, be elected to the House. And I certainly, you know, I always tried to match the demographics of the House to the structure of the House committees. Had Democrat chairs, proudly did. Democrat friends, you know, we passed a budget when the House, when I was first elected speaker in 2009, pretty tough budget year too. We passed our budget in a House that was 76 Republicans and 74 Democrats. We passed the state budget by a vote of 150 to zero. So it's possible. Yeah. You know, I, I, it wasn't that I, long ago. Yeah, well, it was a long time ago now. <laughs> but it is, it is possible, and maybe you know, it argues a little bit toward maybe more closely divided politics can bring you together at times. It should work that way. You work, your, you work your compromises, and you get your votes, and you got to do the people's business. Um, and maybe, maybe that close divide worked. Um, but again, you, ha you have to want things to work to make them work. And right now, the, the in political incentives are toward the primaries. Most of the members don't even want a primary opponent. How do I need to vote so that nobody will challenge me? I've heard members who 
I'm not going to name names, but some Republican members who did not like voting for the abortion or gun bills last time. But they did, and they would say over and over, I had to. I said, well, you had to do what? <laughs> I mean, you're still going to get your $600 a month. <laughs> um, but that's, that's sadly where we are. The political incentives right now are to eliminate, if possible, a challenge in a primary. And the easiest way to do that is to vote for the kind of crazy fringe stuff. Let, let me ask one more question and then open, open it up to the audience. But I want to end in a place that I think is really hopeful, and that is the governance of cities, um, which is something you had talked about. We've seen uh, the kind of get it done government that all of us would like happen most often at the municipal level, frankly. And you have a great deal of experience in that. I mean, and, and you're, you've seen a number of mayors. So who wants to field this first? Uh, Since you know more, let me go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, first, let me say how much I enjoyed working with Mayor Rawlings when he was mayor and I was serving as speaker. Um, I didn't even think about what party he was, you know, he didn't represent a party while he was mayor, but I didn't even care what his philosophy might be. Um, but he did a fantastic job a few years ago um, when I was speaker, working for, toward a improvement, if not a solution, to the pension issues of your city's first responders. He spent more time in Austin from January to May of whatever year that was, 13? No, no, it was, 15? Uh, it was 15. 15. He spent more time in Austin than he did in Dallas. He worked with a very conservative Republican committee chairman who, you know, was, had, was a banker by profession and understood finance. And a lot of our first responders lived in his district. Oh, yeah, that didn't hurt. <laughs> Uh, but they came up with something that worked. Yeah, um, figured out. And so you all have been very lucky in Dallas to have mayors who are pragmatists, who are bipartisan. And um, even the, the mayor you have now is supported by a lot of Republican, strong Republican donors who were, you know, supporters of mine. Um, and that's Strauss. Bipartisan. There's a program at the University of Texas named for her. That's all about civil discourse and bipartisanship and, and others. Um, I think some of our city's mayors are bright spots in our state. Uh, Maddie Parker in Fort Worth, she's fantastic. She's young and she's bright and she's a Republican, but she's not guided by that. She's guided by doing a good job for the you know, people in Fort Worth and she's been outspoken about some of the excesses in our party. I think she's terrific. There's a mayor in Amarillo named Ginger Nelson. She's terrific. She gets things done. And I'm um, crazy about her too. There, there's you know, so many others, but I do think that there is leadership in this state, not elected statewide, um, at the local level that, you know, as they continue to continue to serve and maybe you know, seek other offices or people to watch. You know, um, you said the word that I think is really important in life and then also in politics is incentives, okay? And when people work, there are incentive structures in place, in implicitly or explicitly. And I think the, the, the incentive program, let's call it, at the municipal level is much better than at the state level, okay? Uh, first of all, you see the, your voters all the time, and the, the problems that you face are very personal to people, and you can't hide from those things. Uh, second is you can't take on um, uh, fiscal strategies that in a company, a company's got to balance its, 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 its balance sheet, and, and so does the city have to do that. And so I think those incentives work 
to try to get solving problems, uh, and I think that's important. Um, I really struggled with how partisanship, and, and, and Dallas is, is a nonpartisan, we don't run with an R&D next to our name, um, but you see it kind of get inside the cities, and I see it in other cities. Mayors would meet, and we would talk, and, and uh, you know, I was always, I, other mayors were upset with Austin because the legislators lived in Austin and they hated what Austin <laughs> was doing, okay? And so we would get the repercussion, and I'm not blaming the mayor for that, it's just the, the policies yeah. they would create. And I start to see it and, and that worries me. Um, and I, I think that we've got to figure out how to um, de-labelize this stuff. Mm -hmm. Not that the policies, there are some policies that are democratic that I think are make Dallas very good. I think we're a very, very welcoming community and I think it's a place people want to come and move to because of that. Um, and so I'm very proud of some of those things. But we've got to do a better job of, of, of minimizing what's cascading down because all city council people or school district people feel they've got to be the mini-me of whatever's happening in Washington or, or, yeah. or, or Austin. Well, that's great. Thank you very much to both of you. And I think we are open now for questions from the audience for a little time. There's a gentleman here in the front that I see. Yes, sir. I think both of you have alluded to things along these lines, but my question is really about uh, the absence of truth in politics and how that has changed. Uh, it involves integrity. How has that disenfranchised voters? And um, I know uh, Mayor Rawlings is very familiar with truth in advertising. We have federal regulations, okay, hey, that stipify, you know, what you can say and whether it's truthful or not, and what do we need to do to make uh, or incentivize uh, truth in politics? You're really going to ask that of a, of a former ad man <laughs> and a <laughs> politician? Um, <clears throat> I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Other well, I'll, I'll start and you jump in, okay? Okay. First of all, I don't think it's just truth in politics, it's truth in our society, okay? And I think just as human beings, speaking truth to your children or your best friend is important to do. It's hard to do because you've got to be candid and, and that's one of the, the, the moral issues I think we're facing in, in, in our society because it's more, much better to be entertained than to be truthful, okay? Because I'll tell you, truth is boring, okay? It just really is. And as you start to write it, people kind of gloss over it. It's much more exciting to see this, and that's where money gets in the way, and this is what we didn't talk about. I was just wondering, is that what's happening to my editorial? Exactly, no, yeah. no, I'm just saying that you're in this industry that you're trying to make money and not making as much. <clears throat> And, you know, um, social media does. So that's the dilemma on this stuff. Now, do I believe that's where we could step up and have a, a bipartisan group to try to speak truth? I mean, to judge truth? When you run an ad, to your point, on a national TV, if you say something that's not truthful, they cannot, you cannot air it. The freedom of speech side gets into that, and there are a lot of civil rights people that want freedom of speech, and I understand that, but there's got to be a governor some places, at least that's where I'm, my point of view is. I don't know how you feel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, it, I think it's really a responsibility of citizens to become informed so that you're not as susceptible to the lies that you will be told. Politicians have been lying since the term politician was <laughs> created. <laughs> and that's never going to change. So it's really, it's up to an informed citizenry to see through it. Rudy's profession plays a role in that. Other organizations out there and nonprofits do. 
Um, educators do, if our state will allow them. Um, so I think, you know, we have, to, we have to rely on the good sense of the American public and of our citizens. Again, going back to the good news of 2022's elections, they seem to be able to see through a lot of it in a lot of places. Um, good. So there's, there's reasons to be encouraged. But don't expect politicians to stop fibbing. Oh, I, I won't. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. In this one right here. Yeah, too. Okay. I'll get Political it. action committees didn't always be a part of our culture. Um, and I'm wondering whether you believe that they have changed uh, the dynamic of what we're dealing with right now. Yeah, I, look, let's just be, I mean, totally candid. When it all comes down, it's all about money um, and, and how, how organizations make money, how get people get political uh, contributions. And that, sadly, I think that too much attention is paid to this because I don't, I think ideas and people blow away money every time, okay? And I see it time and time again. When you have two kind of subpar people, money wins in the long run. And, but it's like, I know that when I turn on TV that someone's got more money and spending more ads. Uh, so um, uh, I, I, uh, it, it's, it's sad, but it's reality that and it's not gonna go away. Money is gonna be there. So the key mm -hmm. is to think more creatively. Think as a third idea. How are we gonna get around this? How are you gonna spread the truth in a way that excites people as opposed to just playing the same old game? That, that's how I put it. I, I was in plenty of elections with two subpar people running. <laughs> and, I had, and I had more money and I won. <laughs> so you prove your point. Um, my, my view on campaign finance and, and contributions to candidates is that PACs really aren't the problem, that large contributions aren't really the problem. Where it gets to be a problem is where, in my view, is where there's no transparency and there's no reporting requirement. And there's these, these I've forgotten, 501c fours, fours <clears throat> where there's enormous sums of money being spent and you don't normally, don't normally know who's giving it. I'm, I am for, I think, I think our system in Texas is almost okay, where there are unlimited contributions that can be given state level, um, but there's full and immediate transparency or close to that. Um, any system that has full and immediate transparency I think is the, is the best. Um, you're not gonna keep money out of politics just not going to happen. But I'm all, blown, money I, will I, always find a way. Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I was naive. I was a business guy. I came in and, you know, running for city hall, it was like $250 to a city council person, $1,000 for mayor. And I didn't realize that you write half a million dollar checks to people at the, at the state level. Is that, do you think that? No, more than that now. Oh, no question. I've heard it, yeah. And it just blew Inflation my mind. is a major problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we have. Yeah, no, it's it's. Look at look at um, the two candidates for governor in this latest election. Big money. Huge money, and and many many of the of the contributions were over a million dollars. No, oh, there was a lady in the third row here. Yeah, and then this, and then this lady here. Yes, ma'am. I see. Go ahead, ma'am, and then then Thank we'll. Thank you so much for speaking to us this evening, us. Uh, Mr. Strauss, Mr. Rawlings, I'm a Dallasite, and I, I, I love the city, it's, it's great. Um, I just wanted to share with you, um, I guest lectured last week at Rice University. My topic was democracy. So I'm full of all kinds of facts and figures. I'm not gonna bore you with all of them. But my question is, 56% um, turnout we had in the US for the midterms. 66% for the 2020 election, the largest ever for the presidential election. Um, 
we rate 31st in voter turnout after Columbia. And it's interesting because there's 42 countries that people automatically are registered to vote. They don't have to take any steps when they turn the age. And those countries had the same lower turnout as we did. So even though I know one of the suggestions was that when you turn a certain age, you're automatically registered to vote, um, that doesn't seem to work. So my question to you is, how the heck do we get people to vote? We had two weeks to vote here in Dallas. I had four polling places within a mile of where I live. What can we do to get people to vote? Number one is have more attractive candidates. I mean, I really I didn't mean that to sound as funny as it did, as it sounded, but if we had more attractive candidates who were speaking to more people and encouraging people to, to participate and have some feeling that they're participating in something worthy and patriotic, I think you might see more participation. I was interested this um, cycle, I, don't, I won't get the numbers right, but there were hundreds of thousands of more voters registered by Democrat activists and hundreds of thousands of more voters registered by Republican workers, and yet our turnout was down. Um, after the Supreme Court decision and the Roe versus Wade thing went away, the speculation was that young people were going to vote. Didn't happen. Participation of younger voters went down in Texas. So, I mean, part of it, I think part of it also, it, this is, again, not scientific, but just as a consumer of politics in the last cycle, um, it's almost intentionally depressing, literally depressing, that the advertising and the messaging is meant for you to turn away from it. And I think that maybe the ad guy here can help with that. But if there was a more inspiring message and messengers who had something to say that would invite people to, to, to participate and to feel good about politics, um, it's been a while since we've seen that kind of campaign. Yeah, I, I agree. First of all, I, I, I think I learned uh, when I went to Australia in, uh, that you get a ticket if you don't vote, okay? <laughs> Seriously, it's like, uh, is that, isn't that correct? I mean, you literally get punished. Now, now, I'm not advocating for that, but it's just, there are different systems as you were just talking about. To me, the marketplace speaks. Now, we can do a lot of legislation about it, but I'm kind of with Joe on this. The marketplace is telling you, I don't care. I'm turning the, that channel off, and I'm going to go worry about my kid's soccer game or uh, making sure that my son shows up for the algebra class, and it's just not important to me. Now, is that right? Probably not, but we got a lot of obese people in, in the country too, and is that right? Probably not. It just, we've got to figure this out better, and better candidates, and more inspiring thoughts, and bringing people along with us. And I believe, which comes back to this, I think the more we come together and we, we unite, that's what's exciting, as opposed to poking each other in the eye. I, I think people want to go away from those fights. That's Some, my somebody will try, will try that approach. <clears throat> yep. It'll, it's, it's risky, but somebody will try it and, it, and it might work. I think we've got time for one more. This, I saw this lady's hand. Oh, no, right, <laughs> I'm sorry. Hi, thank you. Uh, for the uh, 
panel today. Uh, my name is Taryn Brown. I've worked on both sides of the aisle. That was one reason I, I wanted to be here tonight. Back in the day, I supported Fred Meyer. I've supported Eddie Bernice Johnson. But I think we really have to, even though millennials in Texas didn't vote, I think we got to look at young people. Young people are going to change the game. And I'd like for either one of you to make a comment on that. Thank you. <clears throat> Fred Meyer was the best Republican Party chairman the state's had. Um, <clears throat> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about whether I need to comment on the current state party chairman or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let my silence speak for me. Um, you're right, young people are going to save us. But they didn't come out a few weeks ago here. They did in other states. They did in other states for some reason, but not in Texas. And um, they need to. And you know, younger candidates like Maddie Parker, I mentioned earlier, maybe it takes a younger, more dynamic set of candidates than the ones that were presented this time. I don't know. Um, but they, they will. They will save us. The baby boomer, boomers have had it. Sorry. The, yeah, I, I just think that, look, in reality, young we I hate to say this because I'm going to get in trouble, okay? But we've got to f figure out a way to make it easier for them to get involved because they just, if I've got to actually take an hour out of my day to go do that, <clears throat> it's just not the way they live. And it's, I'm sorry, it just, it just drives me crazy. It's like, come on guys, you can do this, all right? And it's they, not this instant gratification. They can do it. I did it. Susie Brown's back here. She worked, she was the first person I saw when I was 17 years old and walked into Senator John Tower's office. And um, that was a formative experience for me. But I knew I could do it because my parents encouraged me to. So there, I, I, would, I would argue there is no lower barrier for entry for young people or old people than politics. There just isn't. You can get involved and do something significant for a campaign. Most of them don't have that much money, and they need help. And it is the easiest thing in the world to show up and, cam and volunteer and be given real responsibility if you're a responsible, capable person. Teenagers can do it. 80-year-olds can do it. I think we better leave it at that. Let's Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Rudy. Great insight. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for Fun. coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, am I on here? Hello, okay, well thank you everyone so much for coming. I could listen to this all night, it's such a critical topic. Uh, I hope this creates conversations for you later tonight, later this year, whatever it may be. Thank you again, we have a small token of our appreciation, we'll take a photo right after that. Have a good evening, join us, please, thank you.